The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 2. Thereupon Krishna, whose divinity does not detract from his joy in battle, explains with all the authority of a son of Vishnu, that according to the scriptures and the best orthodox opinion, it is meet and just to kill one's relatives in war, that Arjuna's duty is to follow the rules of his Kshatriya caste, to fight and slay with a good conscience and a good will, that after all only the body is slain while the soul survives. And he expounds the imperishable Purusha of Sankhya, the unchanging Atman of the Upanishads. Indestructible, learn thou, the life is, spreading life through all. It cannot anywhere, by any means, be anywise diminished, stayed, or changed. But for these fleeting frames which it informs with spirit deathless, endless, infinite, they perish. Let them perish, prince, and fight. He who shall say, Lo, I have slain a man. He who shall think, Lo, I am slain. Those both know not. Life cannot slay. Life is not slain. Never the spirit was born. The spirit shall cease to be never. Never was time. It was not. End and beginning are dreams. Birthless and deathless and changeless remaineth the spirit for ever. Death hath not touched it at all, dead though the house of it seems. Krishna proceeds to instruct Arjuna in metaphysics, blending Sankhya and Vedanta in the peculiar synthesis accepted by the Vaishnavite sect. All things, he says, identify himself with the Supreme Being. Hang on me as hangs a row of pearls upon its string. I am the fresh taste of the water, I the silver of the moon, the gold of the sun, the word of worship in the beds, the thrill that passeth in the ether, and the strength of man's shed seed. I am the good sweet smell of the moistened earth. I am the fire's red light, the vital air moving in all which moves, the holiness of hallowed souls, the root undying, whence hath sprung whatever is, the wisdom of the wise, the intellect of the informed, the greatness of the great, the splendor of the splendid. To him who wisely sees, the Brahmin with his scrolls and sanctities, the cow, the elephant, the unclean dog, the outcast gorging dog's meat, all are one. It is a poem rich in complementary colors, in metaphysical and ethical contradictions that reflect the contrariness and complexity of life. We are a little shocked to find the man taking what might seem to be the higher moral stand, while the god argues for war and slaughter on the shifty ground that life is unkillable and individuality unreal. What the author had in mind to do, apparently, was to shake the Hindu soul out of the enervating quietism of Buddhist piety into a willingness to fight for India. It was the rebellion of a Kshatriya who felt that religion was weakening his country, and who proudly reckoned that many things were more precious than peace. All in all, it was a good lesson which, if India had learned it, might have kept her free. The second of the Indian epics is the most famous and best beloved of all Hindu books, and lends itself more readily than the Mahabharata to Occidental understanding. The Ramayana is briefer, merely running to a thousand pages of forty-eight lines each, and though it too grew by accretion from the third century B.C. to the second century A.D., the interpolations are fewer and do not much disturb the central theme. Tradition attributes the poem to one Valmiki, who, like the supposed author of the larger epic, appears as a character in the tale. But more probably it is the product of many wayside bards, like those who still recite these epics, sometimes for ninety consecutive evenings, to fascinated audiences. As the Mahabharata resembles the Iliad in being the story of a great war fought by gods and men, and partly occasioned by the loss of a beautiful woman from one nation to another, so the Ramayana resembles the Odyssey, and tells of a hero's hardships and wanderings, and of his wife's patient waiting for reunion with him. At the outset we get a picture of a golden age, when Dasarata from his capital Ayodhya ruled the kingdom of Kosala, now Aud. Rich in royal worth and valor, rich in holy Vedic lore, Dasarata ruled his empire in the happy days of yore. Peaceful lived the righteous people, rich in wealth, in merit, High. Envy dwelt not in their bosoms, and their accents shaped no lie. Fathers with their happy households owned their cattle, corn, and gold. Galling penury and famine in Ayodhya had no hold. Nearby was another happy kingdom, Videha, over which King Janak ruled. 
He himself held the plough and tilled the earth like some doughty Cincinnatus. And one day at the touch of his plough, a lovely daughter, Sita, sprang up from a furrow of the soil. Soon Sita had to be married, and Janak held a contest for her suitors. He who could unbend Janak's bow of war should win the bride. To the contest came the oldest son of Dasarata, Rama, lion-chested, mighty-armored, lotus-eyed, stately as the jungle tusker, with his crown of tresses tied. Only Rama bent the bow, and Janak offered him his daughter with the characteristic formula of Hindu marriage. This is Sita, child of Janak, dearer unto him than life, henceforth sharer of thy virtue, be she, prince, thy faithful wife. Of thy weal and woe, partaker, be she thine in every land. Cherish her in joy and sorrow, clasp her hand within thy hand. As the shadow to the substance to her lord is faithful wife, and my Sita, best of women, follows thee in death or life. So Rama returns to Ayodhya with his princess bride, ivory brow and lip of coral, sparkling teeth of pearly sheen, and wins the love of the Kosalas by his piety, his gentleness, and his generosity. Suddenly evil enters into this Eden in the form of Dasarata's second wife, Kaikeyi. Dasarata has promised her any boon she may ask, and now, jealous of the first wife, whose son Rama is heir to the throne, she requires Dasarata to banish Rama from the kingdom for fourteen years. Dasarata, with a sense of honor which only a poet unacquainted with politics could conceive, keeps his word, and broken-hearted exiles his favorite son. Rama forgives him handsomely and prepares to go and live in the forest alone, but Sita insists upon going with him. Her speech is part of the memory of almost every Hindu bride. Car and steed and gilded palace, vain are these to woman's life. Dearer is her husband's shadow to the loved and loving wife. Happier than in father's mansions, in the woods will Sita rove, waste no thought on home or kindred, nestling in her husband's love. And the wild fruit she will gather from the fresh and fragrant wood, and the food by Rama tasted shall be Sita's cherished food. Even his brother Lakshman begs leave to accompany Rama. All alone with gentle Sita thou shalt trace thy darksome way. Grant it that thy faithful Lakshman shall protect her night and day. Grant it with his bow and quiver, Lakshman shall all forests roam, and his axe shall fell the jungle, and his hands shall rear the home. The epic becomes at this point a sylvan idol, telling how Rama, Sita, and Lakshman set out for the woods, how the population of Ayodhya, mourning for them, travel with them all the first day, how the exiles steal away from their solicitous company at night, abandon all their valuables and princely raiment, dress themselves in bark and matted grass, clear away through the forest with their swords, and live on the fruits and nuts of the trees. Off to Rama turned his consort, pleased and curious evermore, asked the name of tree or creeper, fruit or flower unseen before. Peacocks flew around them gaily, monkeys left on branches bent, Rama plunged into the river neath the morning's crimson beam. Sita softly sought the waters as the lily seeks the stream. They build a hut beside the river and learn to love their life in the woods. But a southern princess, Surpanaka, wandering in the forest, meets Rama, falls in love with him, resents his virtue, and instigates her brother Ravan to come and kidnap Sita. He succeeds, snatches her away to his distant castle, and tries in vain to seduce her. Since nothing is impossible to gods and authors, Rama raises a great army, invades Ravan's realm, defeats him in battle, rescues Sita, and then, his years of exile having ended, flies with her in an airplane back to Ayodhya, where another loyal brother gladly surrenders to him the Kosala throne. In what is probably a later epilogue, Rama gives way to the skeptics who will not believe that Sita could have been so long in Ravan's palace without being occasionally in his arms. Though she passes through the ordeal of fire to prove her innocence, he sends her away to a forest hermitage with that bitter trick of heredity whereby one generation repeats upon the next the sins and errors which it suffered from its elders in its youth. In the woods, Sita meets Valmiki and bears two sons to Rama. Many years later, these sons, as traveling minstrels, sing before the unhappy Rama the epic composed about him by Valmiki from Sita's memories. He recognizes the boys as his own and sends a message begging Sita to return. But Sita, broken-hearted over the suspicion to which she has been subjected, disappears into the earth that was once her mother. Rama reigns many years in loneliness and sorrow, and under his kindly sway Ayodhya knows again the utopia of Dasarata's days. 
and tis told by ancient sages during Rama's happy reign, death untimely, dire diseases, came not to his subject men. Widows wept not in their sorrow for their lords untimely lost. Mothers wailed not in their anguish for their babes by Yama crossed. Robbers, cheats, and gay deceivers tempted not with lying word. Neighbor loved his righteous neighbor, and the people loved their lord. Trees their ample produce yielded as returning seasons went, and the earth in grateful gladness never failing harvest lent. Rains descended in their season, never came the blighting gale, Rich in crop and rich in pasture was each soft and smiling vale. Loom and anvil gave their produce, and the tilled and fertile soil and the nation lived rejoicing in their old ancestral toil. It is a delightful story which even a modern cynic can enjoy if he is wise enough to yield himself now and then to romance and the lilt of song. These poems, though perhaps inferior to the epics of Homer in literary quality, in logic of structure and splendor of language, in depth of portraiture and fidelity to the essence of things, are distinguished by fine feeling, a lofty idealization of woman and man, and a vigorous, sometimes realistic, representation of life. Rama and Sita are too good to be true, but Draupadi and Yudhishthira, Dhritarashtra and Gandhari are almost as living as Achilles and Helen, Ulysses and Penelope. The Hindu would rightly protest that no foreigner can judge these epics or even understand them, to him they are not mere stories, they are a gallery of ideal characters upon whom he may mold his conduct. They are a repertory of the traditions, philosophy, and theology of his people. In a sense, they are sacred scriptures to be read as a Christian reads the imitation of Christ or the lives of the saints. The pious Hindu believes that Krishna and Rama were incarnations of divinity and still prays to them, and when he reads their story in these epics he feels that he derives religious merit as well as literary delight and moral exaltation. He trusts that if he reads the Ramayana he will be cleansed of all sin and will beget a son, and he accepts with simple faith the proud conclusion of the Mahabharata. If a man reads the Mahabharata and has faith in its doctrines, he becomes free from all sin and ascends to heaven after his death. As butter is to all other food, as Brahmins are to all other men, as the ocean is to a pool of water, as the cow is to all other quadrupeds, so is the Mahabharata to all other histories. He who attentively listens to the shlokas, or couplets, of the Mahabharata, and has faith in them, enjoys a long life and solid reputation in this world, and an eternal abode in the heavens in the next. 4. Drama Origins The Clay Cart Characteristics of Hindu Drama Kalidasa The Story of Shakuntala Estimate of Indian Drama in one sense, drama in India is as old as the Vedas, for at least the germ of drama lies in the Upanishads. Doubtless older than these scriptures is a more active source of the drama, the sacrificial and festival ceremonies and processions of religion. A third origin was in the dance, no mere release of energy, much less a substitute for coitus, but a serious ritual imitating and suggesting actions and events vital to the tribe. Perhaps a fourth source lay in the public and animated recitation of epic verse. These factors cooperated to produce the Indian theater and gave it a religious stamp that lingered throughout the classic age in the serious nature of the drama, the Vedic or epic source of its subjects, and the benediction that always preceded the play. Perhaps the final stimulus to drama came from the intercourse established by Alexander's invasion between India and Greece. We have no evidence of Hindu dramas before Ashoka, and only uncertain evidence during his reign. The oldest extant Hindu plays are the palm-leaf manuscripts lately discovered in Chinese Turkestan. Among them were three dramas, one of which names as its author Ashvagosha, a theological luminary at Kanishka's court. The technical form of this play, and the resemblance of its buffoon to the type traditionally characteristic of the Hindu theater, suggest that drama was already old in India when Ashvagosha was born. In 1910, thirteen ancient Sanskrit plays were found in Travancore, which were dubiously ascribed to Basa, circa 350 A.D., a dramatic predecessor much honored by Kalidasa. In the prologue to his Malavika, Kalidasa unconsciously but admirably illustrates the relativity of time and adjectives. Shall we, he asks, neglect the works of such renowned authors as Basa, Salmila, and Kaviputra? Can the audience feel any respect for the work of a modern poet, a Kalidasa? 
Until recently, the oldest Hindu play known to research was The Clay Cart. The text, which need not be believed, names as author of the play an obscure King Shudraka, who is described as an expert in the Vedas, in mathematics, in the management of elephants, and in the art of love. In any event, he was an expert in the theatre. His play is by all means the most interesting that has come to us from India, a clever combination of melodrama and humour, with excellent passages of poetic fervour and description. A synopsis of its plot will serve better than a volume of commentary to illustrate the character of Indian drama. In Act I we meet Charudatta, once rich, now impoverished by generosity and bad fortune. His friend, Maitreya, a stupid Brahmin, acts as jester in the play. Charu asks Maitreya to offer an oblation to the gods, but the Brahmin refuses, saying, What's the use when the gods you have worshipped have done nothing for you? Suddenly, a young Hindu woman of high family and great wealth rushes into Charu's courtyard, seeking refuge from a pursuer who turns out to be the king's brother, Samstanaka, as completely and incredibly evil as Charu is completely and irrevocably good. Charu protects the girl, sends Samstanaka off, and scorns the latter's threat of vengeance. The girl, Vasantasena, asks Charu to keep a casket of jewels in safe custody for her, lest her enemies steal it from her, and lest she may have no excuse for revisiting her rescuer. He agrees, takes the casket, and escorts her to her palatial home. Act Two is a comic interlude. A gambler, running away from two other gamblers, takes refuge in a temple. When they enter, he eludes them by posing as the idol of the shrine. The pursuing gamblers pinch him to see if he is really a stone god, but he does not move. They abandon their search and console themselves with a game of dice at the foot of the altar. The game becomes so exciting that the statue, unable to control himself, leaps off his pedestal and asks leave to take part. The others beat him. He again finds help in his heels and is saved by Vasantasena, who recognizes in him a former servant of Charudatta. Act Three shows Charu and Maitreya returning from a concert. A thief, Sharvilaka, breaks in and steals the casket. Charu, discovering the theft, feels disgraced and sends Vasantasena his last string of pearls as a substitute. In Act Four, Sharvilaka is seen offering the stolen casket to Vasantasena's maid as a bribe for her love. Seeing that it is her mistress's casket, she berates Sharvilaka as a thief. He answers her with Schopenhauerian acerbity. A woman will for money smile or weep, according to your will. She makes a man put trust in her, but trusts him not herself. Women are as inconstant as the waves of ocean. Their affection is as fugitive as streak of sunset glow upon a cloud. They cling with eager fondness to the man who yields them wealth, which they squeeze out like sap out of a juicy plant, and then they leave him. The maid refutes him by forgiving him, and Vasantasena by allowing them to marry. At the opening of Act V, Vasantasena comes to Charu's house to return both his jewels and her casket. While she is there, a storm blows up, which she describes in excellent Sanskrit. An exceptional instance, usually in Hindu plays, the women speak Prakrit, on the ground that it would be unbecoming in a lady to be familiar with a dead language. The storm obligingly increases its fury and compels her, much according to her will, to spend the night under Charu's roof. Act Six shows Vasanta leaving Charu's house the next morning. By mistake, she steps not into the carriage she has summoned for her, but into one which belongs to the villainous Samstanaka. Act Seven is concerned with a subordinate plot, inessential to the theme. Act Eight finds Vasanta deposited not in her palace as she had expected, but in the home, almost in the arms of her enemy. When she again spurns his love, he chokes her and buries her. Then he goes to court and lodges against Charu a charge of murdering Vasanta for her jewels. Act Nine describes the trial, in which Maitreya unwittingly betrays his master by letting Vasanta's jewels fall from his pocket. Charu is condemned to death. In Act Ten, Charu is seen on his way to execution. His child pleads with the executioners to be allowed to take his place, but they refuse. At the last moment, Vasanta herself appears. Shavalaka had seen Samstanaka bury her. He had exhumed her in time and had revived her. Now, while Vasanta rescues Charu, Shavalaka accuses the king's brother of murder. But Charu refuses to support the charge, Samstanaka is released, and everybody is happy. Since time is more plentiful in the East, where nearly all work is done by human hands than in the West, where there are so many labor-saving devices, 
Hindu plays are twice as long as the European dramas of our day. The acts vary from five to ten, and each act is unobtrusively divided into scenes by the exit of one character and the entrance of another. There are no unities of time or place and no limits to imagination. Scenery is scanty, but costumes are colorful. Sometimes living animals enliven the play and for a moment redeem the artificial with the natural. The performance begins with a prologue in which an actor or the manager discusses the play. Goethe seems to have taken from Kalidasa the idea of a prologue for Faust. The prologue concludes by introducing the first character who marches into the middle of things. Coincidences are innumerable, and supernatural influences often determine the course of events. A love story is indispensable, so is a jester. There is no tragedy in the Indian theatre. Happy endings are unavoidable. Faithful love must always triumph. Virtue must always be rewarded, if only to balance reality. Philosophical discourse, which obtrudes so often into Hindu poetry, is excluded from Hindu drama. Drama, like life, must teach only by action, never by words. Lyric poetry alternates with prose according to the dignity of the topic, the character, and the action. Sanskrit is spoken by the upper castes in the play, Prakrit by the women and the lower castes. Descriptive passages excel. Character delineation is poor. The actors, who include women, do their work well with no Occidental haste and with no Far Eastern fustian. The play ends with an epilogue in which the favorite god of the author or the locality is importuned to bring prosperity to India. Ever since Sir William Jones translated it and Goethe praised it, the most famous of Hindu dramas has been the Shakuntala of Kalidasa. Nevertheless, we know Kalidasa only through three plays and through the legends that pious memory has hung upon his name. Apparently he was one of the nine gems, poets, artists, and philosophers, who were cherished by King Vikramadita, 380 to 413 A.D., in the Gupta capital at Ujjain. Shakuntala is in seven acts, written partly in prose, partly in vivid verse. After a prologue in which the manager invites the audience to consider the beauties of nature, the play opens upon a forest glade in which a hermit dwells with his foster daughter Shakuntala. The peace of the scene is disturbed by the noise of a chariot. Its occupant, King Dushyanta, appears and falls in love with Shakuntala with literary speed. He marries her in the first act, but is suddenly called back to his capital, he leaves her with the usual promises to return at his earliest convenience. An ascetic tells the sorrowing girl that the king will remember her as long as she keeps the ring Dushyanta has given her, but she loses the ring while bathing. About to become a mother, she journeys to the court, only to discover that the king has forgotten her after the manner of men to whom women have been generous. She tries to refresh his memory. Shakuntala Do you not remember in the jasmine bower one day how you had poured the rainwater that a lotus had collected in its cup into the hollow of your hand? King. Tell on, I am listening. Shakuntala. Just then my adopted child, the little fawn, ran up with long, soft eyes, and you, before you quenched your own thirst, gave to the little creature, saying, Drink you first, gentle fawn. But she would not from strange hands. And yet immediately after, when I took some water in my hand, she drank, absolute in her trust. Then with a smile you said, each creature has faith in its own kind. You are children both of the same wild wood, and each confides in the other, knowing where its trust is. King. Sweet, fair, and false, such women entice fools. The female gift of cunning may be marked in creatures of all kinds, in women most. The cuckoo leaves her eggs for dupes to hatch, then flies away secure and triumphing. Shakuntala, spurned and despondent, is miraculously lifted into the air and carried off to another forest, where she bears her child, that great Bharata whose progeny must fight all the battles of the Mahabharata. Meanwhile a fisherman has found the ring, and seeing the king's seal on it, has brought it to Dushyanta. His memory of Shakuntala is restored, and he seeks her everywhere. Travelling in his airplane over the Himalayas, he alights by dramatic providence at the very hermitage where Shakuntala is pining away. He sees the boy Bharata playing before the cottage and envies his parents. Ah, happy father, happy mother, who, carrying their little son, are soiled with dust rubbed from his body. It nestles with fond faith into their lap, the refuge that he craves. The white buds of his teeth just visible when he breaks out into a causeless smile, and he attempts sweet wordless sounds, melting the heart more than any word. Shakuntala appears, the king begs her forgiveness, receives it, and makes her his queen. 
The play ends with a strange but typical invocation. May kings reign only for their subjects' weal. May the divine Sarasvati, the source of speech and goddess of dramatic art, be ever honored by the great and wise. And may the purple self-existent god, whose vital energy pervades all space, from future transmigrations save my soul. Drama did not decline after Kalidasa, but it did not again produce a Shakuntala or a clay cart. King Harsha, if we may believe a possibly inspired tradition, wrote three plays which held the stage for centuries. A hundred years after him, Bhavabhuti, a Brahmin of Berar, wrote three romantic dramas which are ranked second only to Kalidasa's in the history of the Indian stage. His style, however, was so elaborate and obscure that he had to be, and of course protested that he was, content with a narrow audience. How little do they know, he wrote, who speak of us with censure. The entertainment is not for them. Possibly someone exists or will exist of similar tastes with myself, for time is boundless and the world is wide. We cannot rank the dramatic literature of India on a plane with that of Greece or Elizabethan England, but it compares favorably with the theater of China or Japan. Nor need we look to India for the sophistication that marks the modern stage. That is an accident of time rather than an eternal verity, and may pass away, even into its opposite. The supernatural agencies of Indian drama are as alien to our taste as the deus ex machina of the enlightened Euripides, but this too is a fashion of history. The weaknesses of Hindu drama, if they may be listed diffidently by an alien, are artificial diction disfigured with alliteration and verbal conceits, monochromatic characterization in which each person is thoroughly good or thoroughly bad, improbable plots turning upon unbelievable coincidences, and an excess of description and discourse over that action which is, almost by definition, the specific medium by which drama conveys its significance. Its virtues are its creative fancy, its tender sentiment, its sensitive poetry, and its sympathetic evocation of nature's beauty and terror. About national types of art there can be no disputation. We can judge them only from the provincial standpoint of our own, and mostly through the prism of translation. It is enough that Goethe, ablest of all Europeans to transcend provincial and national barriers, found the reading of Shakuntala among the profound experiences of his life, and wrote of it gratefully, Wouldst thou the young year's blossoms and the fruits of its decline, and all by which the soul is charmed, enraptured, feasted, fed, wouldst thou the earth and heaven itself in one soul name combine? I name thee, O Shakuntala, and all at once is said. 5. Prose and Poetry Their Unity in India, Fables, History, Tales, Minor Poets, Rise of the Vernacular Literature, Chandidas, Tulsidas, Poets of the South, Kabir. Prose is largely a recent phenomenon in Indian literature and might be termed an exotic corruption through contact with Europeans. To the naturally poetic soul of the Hindu, everything worth writing about had a poetic content and invited a poetic form. Since he felt that literature should be read aloud and knew that his work would spread and endure, if at all by oral rather than written dissemination, he chose to give to his compositions a metric or aphoristic form that would lend itself to recitation and memory. Consequently, nearly all the literature of India is verse. Scientific, medical, legal, and art treatises are, more often than not, presented in meter or rhyme or both. Even grammars and dictionaries have been turned into poetry. Fables and history, which in the West are content with prose, found in India a melodious poetic form. Hindu literature is especially rich in fables. Indeed, India is probably responsible for most of the fables that have passed like an international currency across the frontiers of the world. Buddhism flourished best in the days when the Jataka legends of Buddha's birth and youth were popular among the people. The best-known book in India is the Panchatantra, or Five Headings, circa 500 A.D. It is the source of many of the fables that have pleased Europe as well as Asia. The Hitopadesha, or Good Advice, is a selection and adaptation of tales from the Panchatantra. Both, strange to say, are classed by the Hindus under the rubric of Niti Shastra, that is, instructions in politics or morals. Every tale is told to point a moral, a principle of conduct or government. Usually these stories pretend to have been invented by some wise Brahmin for the instruction of a king's sons. Often they turn the lowliest animals to the uses of the subtlest philosophy. The fable of the monkey who tried to warm himself by the light of a glowworm and slew the bird who pointed out his error 
is a remarkably apt illustration of the faith that awaits the scholar who exposes a popular delusion. A lively war rages in the fields of Oriental scholarship as to whether these fables pass from India to Europe or turn about. We leave the dispute to men of leisure. Perhaps they passed to both India and Europe from Egypt, via Mesopotamia and Crete. The influence of the Panchatantra upon the Arabian Nights, however, is beyond question. Historical literature did not succeed in rising above the level of either bare chronicles or gorgeous romance. Perhaps through a scorn of the Maya events of space and time, perhaps through a preference of oral to written traditions, the Hindus neglected to compose works of history that could bear comparison with Herodotus or Thucydides, Plutarch or Tacitus, Gibbon or Voltaire. Details of place and date were so scantily recorded, even in the case of famous men, that Hindu scholars assigned to their greatest poet, Kalidasa, dates ranging over a millennium. Living to our own time in an almost unchanging world of custom, morals, and beliefs, the Hindu hardly dreamed of progress and never bothered about antiquities. He was content to accept the epics as authentic history and to let legend serve for biography. When Ashva Gosha wrote his life of Buddha, the Buddha Charita, it was legend rather than history. And when, five hundred years later, Bana wrote his Harsha Charita, it was again an idealization rather than a reliable portrait of the great king. The native chronicles of Rajputana appear to be exercises in patriotism. Only one Hindu writer seems to have grasped the function of the historian. Kalana, author of the Rajatarangini, or Stream of Kings, expressed himself as follows, That noble-minded poet alone merits praise whose word, like the sentence of a judge, keeps free from love or hatred in recording the past. Vinternitz called him the only great historian that India has produced. The Moslems were more acutely conscious of history and left some admirable prose records of their doings in India. We have mentioned Al-Biruni's ethnographical study of India and Babur's memoirs. Contemporary with Akbar was an excellent historian, Muhammad de Kazim Firishta, whose history of India is our most reliable guide to the events of the Moslem period. Less impartial was Akbar's prime minister or general political factotum, Abu el-Fazl, who put his master's administrative methods down for posterity in the Aini Akbari, or Institutes of Akbar, and told his master's life with forgivable fondness in the Akbar Nama. The emperor returned his affection, and when the news came that Jehangir had slain the vizier, Akbar burst into a passionate grief and cried out, if Salim, Jehangir, wished to be emperor, he might have slain me and spared Abu el Fazl. Midway between fables and history were the vast collections of poetic tales put together by industrious versifiers for the delectation of the romantic Indian soul. As far back as the first century A.D., one Gunadya wrote in 100,000 couplets the Brihatkata, or Great Romance, and a thousand years later, Somadeva composed the Katasritsagara, or Ocean of the Rivers of Story, a torrent 21,500 couplets long. In the same eleventh century, a clever storyteller of uncertain identity built a framework for his Betala Panchavimchatika, the twenty-five stories of the vampire, by representing King Vikramaditya as receiving annually from an ascetic a fruit containing a precious stone. The king inquires how he may prove his gratitude. He is asked to bring to the yogi the corpse of a man hanging on the gallows, but is warned not to speak if the corpse should address him. The corpse is inhabited by a vampire who, as the king stumbles along, fascinates him with a story. At the end of the story, the vampire propounds a question which the king, forgetting his instructions, answers. Twenty-five times the king attempts the task of bringing a corpse to the ascetic and holding his peace, Twenty-four times he is so absorbed in the story that the vampire tells him that he answers the question put to him at the end. It was an excellent scaffold on which to hang a score of tales. Meanwhile, there was no dearth of poets writing what we should call poetry. Abu el Fazl describes thousands of poets at Akbar's court. There were hundreds at minor capitals and doubtless dozens in every home. Poetry tended now to be less objective than in the days of the epic, and gave itself more and more to the interweaving of religion and love, meter which had been loose and free in the epics, varying in the length of the line and requiring regularity only in the last four or five syllables, became at once stricter and more varied. A thousand complications of prosody were introduced, 
which disappear in translation. Artifices of letter and phrase abounded, and rhyme appeared not only at the end but often in the middle of the line. Rigid rules were composed for the poetic art, and the form became more precise as the content thinned. One of the earliest and greatest was Bartrehari, monk, grammarian, and lover who, before retiring into the arms of religion, instructed his soul with amours. He has left us a record of them in his Century of Love, a Heine-like sequence of a hundred poems. Erstwhile, he writes to one of his loves, we twain deemed that thou wast I and I wast thou. How comes it now that thou art thou and I am I? He did not care for reviewers, and told them, It is easy to satisfy one who is ignorant, even easier to satisfy a connoisseur. But not the Creator Himself can please the man who has just a morsel of knowledge. In Jayadeva's Gita Govinda, or Song of the Divine Cowherd, the amorousness of the Hindu turns to religion, and intones the sensuous love of Radha and Krishna. It is a poem of full-bodied passion, but India interprets it reverently as a mystic and symbolic portrayal of the soul's longing for God, an interpretation that would be intelligible to those immovable divines who composed such pious headings for the Song of Songs. In the eleventh century the vernaculars made inroads upon the classical dead language as a medium of literary expression, as they were to do in Europe a century later. The first major poet to use the living speech of the people was Chand Bardai, who wrote in Hindi an immense historical poem of sixty cantos, and was only persuaded to interrupt his work by the call of death. Sur Das, the blind poet of Agra, composed sixty thousand verses on the life and adventures of Krishna. We are told that he was helped by the god himself, who became his amanuensis, and wrote faster than the poet could dictate. Meanwhile, a poor priest, Chandi Das, was shocking Bengal by composing Dantean songs to a peasant Beatrice, idealizing her with romantic passion, exalting her as a symbol of divinity, and making his love an allegory of his desire for absorption in God. At the same time, he inaugurated the use of Bengali as a literary language. I have taken refuge at your feet, my beloved. When I do not see you, my mind has no rest. I cannot forget your grace and your charm, and yet there is no desire in my heart. Excommunicated by his fellow Brahmins on the ground that he was scandalizing the public, he agreed to renounce his love, Rami, in a public ceremony of recantation. But when in the course of this ritual he saw Rami in the crowd, he withdrew his recantation, and going up to her, bowed before her with hands joined in adoration. The supreme poet of Hindi literature is Tulsi Das, almost a contemporary of Shakespeare. His parents exposed him because he had been born under an unlucky star. He was adopted by a forest mystic who instructed him in the legendary lore of Rama. He married, but when his son died, Tulsi Das retired to the woods to lead a life of penance and meditation. There and in Banares he wrote his religious epic, the Rama Charita Manasa, or Lake of the Deeds of Rama in which he told again the story of Rama and offered him to India as the supreme and only God. There is one God, says Tulsidas. It is Rama, creator of heaven and earth, and redeemer of mankind. For the sake of his faithful people, a very God, Lord Rama, became incarnate as a king, and for our sanctification lived as it were the life of any ordinary man. Few Europeans have been able to read the work in the now archaic Hindi original, one of these considers that it establishes Tulsi Das as the most important figure in the whole of Indian literature. To the natives of Hindustan, the poem constitutes a popular Bible of theology and ethics. I regard the Ramayana of Tulsi Das, says Gandhi, as the greatest book in all devotional literature. Meanwhile, the Deccan was also producing poetry. Tukaram composed in the Marathi tongue 4,600 religious songs which are as current in India today as the Psalms of David are in Judaism or Christendom. His first wife having died, he married a shrew and became a philosopher. It is not hard to win salvation, he wrote, for it may readily be found in the bundle on our back. As early as the second century A.D., Madura became the capital of Tamil letters. A sangam, or court of poets and critics, was set up there under the patronage of the Pandya kings, and like the French Academy, regulated the development of the language, conferred titles, and gave prizes. Tiru Valavar, an outcast weaver, wrote in the most difficult of Tamil meters a religious and philosophical work, the Koral, expounding moral and political ideals. 
Tradition assures us that when the members of the Sangam, who were all Brahmins, saw the success of this pariah's poetry, they drowned themselves to a man. But this is not to be believed of any academy. We have kept for the last, though out of his chronological place, the greatest lyric poet of medieval India. Kabir, a simple weaver of Banares, prepared for his task of uniting Islam and Hinduism by having, we are told, a Mohammedan for his father and a Brahmin virgin for his mother. Fascinated by the preacher Ramananda, he became a devotee of Rama, enlarged him, as Tulsidas would also do, into a universal deity, and began to write Hindi poems of rare beauty to explain a creed in which there should be no temples, no mosques, no idols, no caste, no circumcision, and but one God. Kabir, he says, is a child of Ram and Allah, and accepteth all gurus and peers. O God, whether Allah or Rama, I live by thy name. Lifeless are all the images of the gods. They cannot speak. I know it, for I have called aloud to them. What avails it to wash your mouth, count your beads, bathe in holy streams, and bow in temples, if, whilst you mutter your prayers or go on pilgrimages, deceitfulness is in your hearts? The Brahmins were shocked, and to refute him, the story runs, sent a courtesan to tempt him. But he converted her to his creed. This was easy, for he had no dogmas, but only profound religious feeling. There is an endless world, O my brother, and there is a nameless being of whom naught can be said. Only he knows who has reached that region. It is other than all that is heard or said. No form, no body, no length, no breadth is seen there. How can I tell you that which it is? Kabir says, It cannot be told by the words of the mouth. It cannot be written on paper. It is like a dumb person who tastes a sweet thing. How shall it be explained? He accepted the theory of reincarnation which was in the air about him, and prayed like a Hindu to be released from the chain of rebirth and redeath. But his ethic was the simplest in the world. Live justly and look for happiness at your elbow. I laugh when I hear that the fish in the water is thirsty. You do not see that the real is in your home, and you wander from forest to forest listlessly. Here is the truth. Go where you will, to Benares or to Matura. If you do not find your soul, the world is unreal to you. To what shore would you cross, O oh my heart? There is no traveller before you, there is no road. There there is neither body nor mind, and where is the place that shall still the thirst of the soul? You shall find naught in the emptiness. Be strong, and enter into your own body, for there your foothold is firm. Consider it well, O oh my heart, go not elsewhere. Kabir says, Put all imaginations away, and stand fast in that which you are. After his death, runs the legend, Hindus and Mohammedans contended for his body, and disputed whether it should be buried or burned. But while they disputed, someone raised the cloth that covered the corpse, and nothing could be seen but a mass of flowers. The Hindus burned a part of the flowers in Benares, and the Moslems buried the rest. After his death, his songs passed from mouth to mouth among the people. Nanak the Sikh was inspired by them to, to found his sturdy sect. Others made the poor weaver into a deity. Today two small sects, jealously separate, follow the doctrine and worship the name of this poet who tried to unite Moslems and Hindus. One sect is Hindu, the other is Moslem. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1.